Margaret was going over the resume, and I think uh, the promotion I took two years ago was more of a demotion when you do the math. Um, I think I took on a little bit too much. Um, and, and what I truly love about the job that I still have as project manager at the UW is uh, the irrigation piece and, and being involved in that collaboration that Dale was talking about with, with all of you, with all the stakeholders. Uh, so I'm going to discuss tips for managing successful irrigation projects. Uh, the topic is key to long-term irrigation system viability and water conservation. Um, I'm only going to be able to scratch the surface. Uh, the PowerPoint's probably 20-30 minutes, so I'm going to skim over things, but the cool thing is you can all go back and reread it if you're interested. My goal is to create a framework for you and also um, encouragement to pursue the topic further. Um, diverse group here, and it's important to acknowledge that diversity uh, different stakeholders, different roles, um, different angles. Uh, for me, and what, what I'm presenting uh, through my eyes is as an owner of a large institution with a pretty good irrigation infrastructure, um, large cap uh, public works construction, um, but probably something that we all have akin, um, underfunded budgets and, and limited resources nonetheless. So um, I may ask for a few one-liners. That means yes or no or one word, um, just to keep things moving. Um, we'll do the, the question and answer at the end. But please do shout out when I give you the opportunity. So my thing starts with a story. And this is like 15, 16 years ago. Um, I was much younger, had hair, um, actually long hair. And uh, uh, we had just got a brand new irrigation project uh, uh, completed and a new system. And uh, I was a temporary irrigation specialist, and boy was I angry. And this is what this is the the name of the, the chapter. It's fine. We're not going to do anything. It's not our fault. And what that was in response to was a brand new uh, irrigation system. Uh, contractor installed. It didn't work. It was uh, it was horrible. It would have taken a lot of time and money to fix it. And so uh, my colleagues and I decided to walk away. Well, you know, a couple months later, start of the growing season, we got calls, our management got calls from concerned customers that wondered how, with this esteemed uh, uh, higher education uh, uh, business that we have, how we could have totally screwed up a brand new landscape within two months. And so we were promptly uh, told to get back there and fix it. We did do that, but with no surprise, fast forward two, three weeks later, and other stakeholders called from around the campus wondering why their landscapes and irrigation systems weren't being maintained. So what this started during a record time of university growth was uh, a situation where we just we had a real challenge juggling uh, keeping our existing systems functioning and trying to plug the holes from, from bad design, bad construction uh, with capital construction and also doing a little bit of uh, in-house work as well for, for construction. So um, I think every, anybody have that kind of experience of getting a brand new system and it didn't work? Yeah, and um, it happens. But who, who do you, this is the opportunity for a one-liner. Whose fault was it? Who? Okay, who, who else? You, you, can, you can blame, so it goes back to what Dale was talking about. It's everybody's. Okay, you can't say it's the contractors. You can't say it's the uh, designers or the landscape architects or the general contractors, or the prime architect. Um, I'm at fault. My team is at fault. I can't hide behind, as an owner and user, I cannot hide behind my capital projects construction group to say that they should have done it. They're responsible for that. They don't know a lot about landscaping. I can't hide behind. I can't throw our landscape architect under the bus. She's got. Uh, uh, a lot on her plate, you know, so it's up to the end user to contribute to that process. So I'm going to do the five takeaways in the beginning, that way everything, you can go to sleep after this, everything else is just extra, but these are kind of the five, the five benchmarks that I came up with. Um, number one, I'm just going to read them. Unresolved design and construction issues can result in higher ongoing life cycle maintenance costs, reduce system life, and opportunity costs to other work. Okay, so the takeaway there is if you don't get it right during construction, um, actually before that, upstream, if you don't get it right with design and then in construction or at least during warranty, it's on you. It's your budget and you've got to deal with it. Uh, point number two, 
quality designs and construction are essential to achieving successful landscape irrigation projects, including life cycle maintenance. So if they're not designed well, constructed well, maintenance is going to be tough. I'm also saying that even if it's a perfect design and perfect construction, if it's not maintained on the back end, the project is a failure. Uh, third point, a viable owner landscape irrigation program and qualified end user service provider participation in design and construction are essential to achieving successful projects. So train your people, get them involved. Getting things under control can be a lengthy incremental process. Develop a plan, chip away at it, and think long term. It took us years and we're still, it's a continuous work in progress. So, and, and understand too that it can get worse before it's get better. You'll peel back layers of the onion, you'll find a problem, there'll be another problem under that, and another problem next to that. But eventually, you will get, if you, you put your nose to the grindstone, you will get to irrigation nirvana, where life is good and work life is easier and uh, everything uh, goes well. But again, you have to adopt a, a life cycle um, approach to it, a process of continuous improvement and constantly uh, tweak your offering so that you can stay current and adjust it to changing conditions. Um, becoming a process partner. Uh, my favorite is act as if. And I can't tell you how many times I just showed up at meetings that I wasn't invited to. And I encourage you to do that. Just just get your nose bloody. Give it a shot. Get this. Get the um, support from your superiors. That That is the first step, of course. Um, demonstrate the value of your participation. Go to your superiors, throw them some metrics. Say, hey, look how much water costs for two dozen leaking valves over the irrigation season. Then show them how much it's going to cost their budget if you have to fix them. Okay, And that will um, maybe encourage the nominal cost of you getting involved on the front end with design uh, and construction. It's a team sport, so understand the roles and the conflicting goals of your team, team members. And uh, don't overstep. Uh, figure out what it is that your particular um, uh, organization needs to be successful and then put that information into standards, design standards. And when you have those design standards, you now have a tool that you can communicate with to all the stakeholders, the landscape architect, the designer, to help you with get a great system, the contractor, the architect, the general contractor, everybody, and your own staff. Um, as far as design standards, uh, they should include specifications and details. I think one of the most important aspects of specifications is the products. Find out what works for you. Uh, have a list of those products. Be able to communicate them to the landscape architect. Details. Uh, just a sketch of every assembly. A picture is worth a thousand words. Put those together. Um, there's a URL for the UW. You can look at what we've got. It's a little dated, but it will point you in the right direction. Uh, here's a couple examples of details. The one on the right is a profile of a sprinkler assembly and the one on the left is a plan view of sprinkler setback. And um, back in the day, you know, that 15 years ago or whatever, when I, I was moving hundreds of sprinkler heads uh, and, and I was just, I couldn't figure out why uh, the gardener was edging these sprinklers that were right next to the concrete pathway. And, you know, 50 heads later, I started to ask myself, why did the contractor put them there? And then the light bulb finally went off and we drew up a detail and it really did help to uh, keep that problem from happening. So pictures are important. Um, so with, with design uh, in, in public works, they're, they're a horribly elongated process. It's a neat process, but remember it's usually dovetailing with a building or a major infrastructure. So it takes a long time. Out there in the design build world, residential light construction, done in a day. And so there's a big disparity. But regardless of the circumstance you're in, do try and take a look at the criteria, um, those specifications, those details, those plans beforehand. And if you see problems, comment on those problems. Communicate them to the right people and insist that you get another read when those problems have been corrected. Okay, so one thing that you've got to you've got to really do to help the designer and the landscape architect is to get out there as an owner and uh, you know turn over the rocks and figure out the existing conditions. Get out there with the as builts, make sure they're up to speed. Uh, figure out if there's extra controller capacity, extra spare wires. Where do those spare wires terminate? And be able to give your consultant uh, a design strategy. 
Um, don't be overly prescriptive because you'll undermine their creative process and that's what gives you greater value is bringing in that creativity into your organization but you, only you understand your master plan the big picture and they're working on a small piece of that describe to them how that small piece fits with the bigger picture especially at the University of Washington it's 643 acres and growing um, the other thing is uh, you know, when you get to difficult situations or need custom design solutions, landscape architect doesn't necessarily have a shop and a bunch of sprinklers. Get out there and help them out. Um, this is one where we had a, a, a project, and I wish I had a, a wide angle shot, but we had this horribly narrow sidewalk, and it needed to be a gathering place. And we needed to have a tree there for a lead point, you know? And then we needed to not put any irrigation on that tree, also for a lead point. Um, I think I would have just said, to heck with the lead point, let's keep the tree alive. But I decided to play ball on this particular one, and uh, the client did not want gator bakes. We didn't have the labor for uh, hand watering. And so, you know, after a little bit of tinkering, um, I just uh, figured out how to do serviceable sand set pavers um, in a mortar set uh, sidewalk and then just put dry water tubes, time release water gel under there. And that way we could replenish the dry water every few months uh, during the first few growing seasons to get the tree established. It worked. So have your landscape architect out. Uh, the deliverables they should be getting to you um, are the specifications and that should pull right from your design criteria. So section 32 uh, or division 32, section 84 is your friend. Make sure you go through it, make sure you understand it. Um, a lot of times people won't necessarily read all the all the text, but the plans and the details are really important On a really big job don't try and put everything on one sheet. It's a mess. It's a mess for everybody Try and uh, have a, a demo early worksheet try and have an interim irrigation sheet and also try and have a future state irrigation sheet the uh, end game what you want um, challenges uh, uh, interim irrigation, here, here it is right here, disruption of services uh, or assets to remain inside or outside of the work limit. So if you have trees to remain and you're going to box them in with protective fencing and those trees were used to water, you better figure out a way to keep them watered. If you leave it up to the general contractor, um, they'll probably bring a water truck in and put 100 gallons a minute on them and it's not going to work. So try and figure this out in design. Uh, if you have a mainline control wire and going through that project and there's going to be a mass excavation and it's going to get gobbled up but it goes to a landscape that needs to be remain operational outside of the work limit, compel the project to plan, fund, and execute to keep that operational in the interim and to put it back right at the end. Watch out for discrepancies. As the owner you will always lose. Um, particularly look at related work to make sure there's not discrepancies within that. Uh, check your design calculations, your meat and potatoes, uh, flow calculations, your uh, valve sizing, pipe sizing, and make sure that your water delivery media are and your zoning is matched well with your microclimate variables. little review of those right here. Um, rain shadows are one that you really got to watch out for. If you have a, a natural overhang or a built environment and you have planting under it that needs water, uh, you might think about having winter rated uh, irrigation zones. If uh, you don't have the, the labor to water them in the late fall, early winter, late winter, early spring before you ramp up your irrigation systems. Uh, you know, a parting few tips for design, um, which really have morphed into construction. Make sure uh, that your design is aligned with owner maintenance capacity. The bioretention group uh, early on spoke right to that. If, if the owner can't maintain it, what's the point in building it? Okay. Um, Encourage the landscape architect to coordinate related work, you know, with their electrical consultant, the plumbing consultant, those kind of things. You're going to need electrical for your controller, you're going to need plumbing maybe for an interior point of connection, or pipes through the structure to get to the green roof, okay? You need to, they need to work with those people too. Um, this is one where we, there was no, no protection. It was a roofing job, but it soon became a landscape job, and you want to avoid these kind of things. It's a bad deal. Uh, here's an example of uh, mechanical electrical plumbing coordination, an interior point of connection. That's how we roll at the UW. You've got master valve flow sensor, itron meter, charge meter, a whole bunch of widgets. We've got to do it, um, but it keeps things efficient. And then you've got a controller on the other side. So you need help with all that. 
Um, and then you get to, even with the best design in the world, you get to the, the point of construction. And this is where you can drop the ball. At the beginning of the project, uh, the landscape, arc, the landscape uh, subcontractor goes in there and the Gantt chart shows three months to install this landscape. And you all know when you actually get to the work, there's three weeks. And it's no fair, but it is what it is. So um, when you get to that point, it is a hurry up offense. And I think one of the most important meetings as an owner for me is the pre-installation meeting with the irrigation work package. And if it insists that the foreman who's going to do the work is at that meeting, if they're not, you might as well just schedule a second meeting. They're the people doing the work. That is the opportunity to communicate ideas, look at the designs, uh, clear up any uh, misinterpretations. Really important uh, benchmark. Um, Mock-ups. We do it for walls. We do it for other building systems. Do it for irrigation. You know, everything down to a sprinkler assembly to a valve, an automatic control valve, a quick coupler valve, insist through the specifications that the landscape architect or designer and owner uh, review every single initial uh, assembly, put it in place, make it work, but that they come out and approve, review it and approve it before the contractor puts it in anymore. It's not babysitting, it's safety, it's, it's reducing the risk, it's good for the contractor because then there's, you know, I've had a contractor have to rip out dozens of automatic control valves. It's not fun, it's not good for anybody. So sign off on those initial mock-ups and then there's very little risk going forward. You just have to be responsive so you don't delay um, the, progress, the project. Um, inspections, start early. Don't wait till punch list, it's too late. Um, don't wait till pressure testing, that's too late. And when you do go out for pressure testing, don't just look at a pressure gauge, look at everything. The pipe sizing, the wiring, uh, every aspect of workmanship. And when you do identify problems, find the appropriate channels to com communicate them, identify them, document them, and then track them. Because you can identify all you want, but if you can't track them till they're resolved, it's going to be wasted time. One of the uh, best approaches that we've come up with at the UW to do this is just to have a little mini OAC meeting. You get the civil and the landscape people together and you just have weekly meetings when the, that scope of work has ramped up and um, you sit down for a few and a uh, general contact, contractor takes the notes. You talk about old business, new business, schedule issues, other things that are coming up and then everybody goes outside and kicks the dirt a little bit, finds, finds more things, uh, checks on status of things that are outstanding. So I think that's a, a really good, good way of tracking and resolving uh, corrective work. And I think if you do that, if you do it well, you're not going to have a punch list and, or you're going to have a very small punch list, and that's a good thing. Um, for maintenance and warranty, uh, just have a plant replacement strategy if you do have a, a, a plant warranty. Just figure out who's in charge of it, when that drop dead date is, and how you're going to track plant mortality. Uh, have a good transition, a clean transition between uh, contractor maintenance and owner maintenance so that you just don't, you know, um, uh, have eight inch grass falling over on itself. Um, just to close out, there's just a few more slides, but uh, the biggest challenge for me is when you hear it's just landscaping from the general contractor. And you just got to suck it up and try and do what you can to turn that around and, and put landscaping on the front burner because we all know how important it is. Uh, make sure that the contractor is keeping updated as-built drawings. Do not accept they're back at the office, they're at the shop. Uh, be assertive when you need to. It's not fun, but if you don't, you're going to live with it forever. Understand though that those contractors need to stay in business and that you want them in business and that you want to cross-educate and create a team. You want them back for repeat business, okay? So, and then try and revisit the sites. You know, you're going to get an opportunity to do that at the end of the, the plant warranty, which is a great opportunity but try and do it at the end of two years, three years as well. And talk to the people who work there. It's a great learning opportunity. When you do inspect things, use photo documentation. A few captions tell a, tell a lot. Um, markups are great. This is the lower left-hand corner in large. And just come up with a key, a legend, and it's a great way to efficiently identify issues for a resolution. Last two slides. This is just kind of a where's Waldo of what's wrong with this picture. Um, anybody see it? I'll zoom in a little closer. Anybody see it? So yeah, the the main line is, uh, the box is resting on the main line. All that will take is just someone stepping on it wrong and it's gonna be a breach. So try and provide two inches of clearance around it and filter fabric on the outside of that box to inhibit soil intrusion. 
and uh, you know get some bricks under the corners of the box as well. Last one, what's wrong with this picture? Quick coupler valve and it's above the plane of the concrete protective ring. It should be below the plane of that concrete protective ring. Okay, and that's the concrete protective ring identifies it and also protects it from the load of landscape maintenance equipment. And it just in the end game, you can always circle back to your details and communicate the issue and resolve the problem. That's it.